procedure and all related discourse to be public. In fact, he suggested we get a celebrity to witness the signing. So I asked Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, and Sean Carroll to be our witnesses, and they graciously agreed. And, and Alex, I just want to say, uh, I agree with everything you said about Veritasium, that um, generally I can watch it and not have to wonder, is he going to mess up? What, how am I no, going he's to brilliant. Am no, I he's brilliant. brilliant. I'm excited about this bet because if I am wrong, then I want to know. Like, the whole point of the channel is to get to the truth, and that is, I think, why we're all here today, and I think, you know, this is a great, great chance to sort of see. I'm going to summarize Alex's main points in this video, but I'll put his full presentation here. So let me first explain what I see in the video. In the video, the vehicle is operated in a gusty wind. Initially, you have the wind speed exceeding the car speed, but then the wind speed is not constant. The wind speed drops, and the car moves by inertia with deceleration for a while. So basically, Alex thinks a gust pushes the car to a high speed, and then when the wind dies, the car is going faster than the wind momentarily, but it must be slowing down. In fact, that will be my conclusion at the end of this presentation, that whenever you have velocity faster than the wind, I'll actually show you in an equation, uh, the acceleration is negative. The second effect is that the wind in the, in the video is measured at the height of about a meter or a meter and a half. But the propeller goes to some you know, three meters above the ground. Now, due to interactions with the ground, there is a wind gradient. Wind travels slower, close to the ground, and then faster, higher up. Now, Alex estimated that the wind speed of the propeller might be 10 or 15 percent higher than at the telltale. So it's possible that the car could be moving slower than the wind at the propeller, and yet appear to be moving faster than the wind at the height of the telltale. Now, I think that this is a small effect. However, in combination with the previous effect, it just can make this more frequent. Okay, and that concludes. Okay. Um, if I remember the video correctly, Derek reports that they've achieved up to 2.8 times wind speed. That feels much higher than what is possible here, unless the wind has picked up and then spontaneously sort of dropped. Very, very good question. Okay, if you're going for the record, you probably will do many things. You will be sampling that, that gusty wind over and over and over until you set the record. Right? That's how you set the record. And on one of those occasions, you will get a nice strong gust, which is three times the air that comes after. Okay? And that's when you will clock the record. Uh, and that's where that 2.8 factor will come in. So what about the treadmill tests? These are conducted in still air. By moving the ground backwards, you're simulating a perfectly steady tailwind. And if you hold the car stationary on the treadmill, well, that's equivalent to the car going exactly wind speed. Now, if the car can move forward on the treadmill, that shows it can accelerate faster than the wind. But Alex had multiple explanations why these experiments don't actually show what they claim to show. If you have uh, this uh, you know, fluctuating speed of the treadmill, and then if a human just sort of steers it, it then can, can introduce unconsciously a bias towards the desired result. So would it A be that the guy with the spork is inducing the model craft to go across the rain now and then? So and I, as you pointed out, I was in the yeah, so now. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm 100% sure that uh, the guy in the, in the video doesn't do it uh, uh, on purpose, okay? Yeah. However, you know, if he is expecting uh, forward drift. Yeah, oh, it's right? yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, that, that's, that's what, that, exactly. Okay, so you got it. In the absence of convincing experimental evidence, Alex turned to theoretical analyses, like one by MIT Aero professor Mark Drella. But here, too, he found problems. His main concern is that the equation for net force includes the difference between the speeds of the car and the wind in the denominator, which seems to imply that when traveling exactly wind speed, you should get infinite force. Now, now here's a real danger, because if it, if, if there it drives very close to the wind, that difference in speed goes to zero. If it's one millionth of a one percent, that's like a nuclear bomb exploding behind him. Then Derek is definitely in trouble, right? So we need, we need to find something to save Derek's life here. This is, this is serious, right? But dividing by zero, come on, you guys. I never looked at that. Alex performed his own analysis and found no such divide by zero problems. 
In fact, he found there's no way for the cart to accelerate at or above wind speed. The acceleration of this craft is negative. So when we, you know, so it's possible to move the craft faster than the wind, but it's not possible to move it at zero acceleration, which would be needed to maintain constant speed. That is basically where we left it. Can I get it right? Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very Thanks, much. Guys. Thanks, Neil. Okay. So now it was up to me to convince Professor Kosenko that Blackbird really can go faster than the wind. But his presentation was effective. When I posted about it on Twitter, Alice Zhang, who runs Chinese Veritasium, said, I think you lost, Derek. I'm 80% on Alex's side now. What's amazing to me is that neither one of them had seen my attempts to replicate the treadmill experiments. For the first video, I asked my friend and YouTube maker, Zyla Foxlin, to make a model downwind cart. <laughs> oh, no. Version 1 ended in failure, but Zyla was undeterred, coming back in a couple days with version 2. Is it feeling like it's gonna... Unlike these models, most of her projects actually work. She is it's determined. Closer, so so closer, maybe this tells us something about whether you can actually go faster than the wind downwind. What was clear to me is that I didn't do a good enough job in the first video explaining how Blackbird works and providing convincing evidence that it can really go faster than the wind in a sustained way. In my defense, I thought the concept was well enough established. Way back in 1969, Andrew Bauer built the first successful downwind cart, and he did it to settle a friendly wager with aero engineer Apollo Smith. The bet was inspired by a claim in a student's paper from 20 years earlier. Now, Rick Cavallaro, the builder of Blackbird, was completely unaware of all this until after he built his cart. But other analyses have been published under names like the Push Me, Pull You Boat. So I didn't honestly think anyone would doubt the vehicle's operation, much less bet me $10,000. But clearly there is a need for a deeper explanation. So I want to do that now by responding to the points Alex raised. So first, let's deal with wind gradient. I mean, why didn't we measure the speed of the wind higher up? Well, the answer is because it's already been done. They mounted telltales on fishing poles out to the sides of the propeller and even above it. Now, although the lowest telltale flips back first, all of the telltales do eventually flip backwards, showing that every part of the vehicle is going faster than the wind. Could this be because of a big wind gust that pushed the car up to high speed and then the wind died? I don't think so. Even though I didn't have a speedometer in the car for my runs, Someone on Twitter pointed out that we could use the rotation of the back wheel to determine the speed from the video footage. This shows that even after the telltale flips backwards, the car keeps accelerating. Another thing I want to point out is that if wind gradient or gusts were the reason that the car travels faster than the wind, well, you'd expect the telltale to jump around or at least not point straight back at me. But it consistently does for over 30 seconds until I had to hit the brakes to avoid crashing into parked vehicles. But if that's not enough for you, when Blackbird achieved its record speed of 27.7 miles per hour in a 10 mile per hour tailwind, it was still accelerating. And we know this because there were multiple GPS units in the car and wind speeds which were measured at the height of the propeller at multiple locations. The highlighted section shows the 10 second measurement period over which the record was set. Also, in 2013, the US Physics Olympiad semi-final exam asked questions about Blackbird, like, can it go faster than the wind downwind, and upwind. The solution says, both modes are possible. And, with sufficiently low energy loss, any speed is possible. Now, I'll admit that the evidence I showed in the first video was not definitive. Wind gusts or gradients could have explained the observations. But now that you've seen this evidence, are you convinced that Blackbird can go downwind faster than the wind without slowing down? Well, Professor Kosenko was not convinced. So I want to explain how the car works so clearly that no one, not even the professor, can doubt what's going on. The first thing to know is that the propeller doesn't work like most people think. It's not working like a windmill. It doesn't turn the way the tailwind is pushing it. Instead, it turns in the opposite direction, working like a fan to push air backwards. This fan is powered by the wheels, which are connected to the propeller by a bike chain. So at wind speed, the car can keep accelerating because the wheels turn the fan, which blows air back, generating forward thrust. Now the big question is, to drive the fan, there must be a backwards force on the wheels, which tends to slow them down. So 
why isn't this force bigger than the thrust from the propeller causing the car to slow down overall? Well, the answer is the wheels are going so much faster over the ground than the propeller is moving through the air, so the thrust force can actually be larger. I'm going to do an analysis in the frame of reference of the car. The thrust force can be so much faster over the ground than the propeller is moving through the air, so the thrust force can actually be larger. I'm going to do an analysis in the frame of reference of the car. And the important equation to know is power equals force times velocity. So at the wheels, power is input into the system by the ground moving underneath the car. The power generated is the force of the ground on the wheels times the velocity of the car. At the propeller, work is done on the air as the propeller pushes it backwards. The power out equals the force of the prop on the air times the speed of the car minus the speed of the wind. The prop is going slower through the air due to the tailwind. And if we assume no losses, then the power in at the wheels equals the power out at the propeller. From this equation, we can see that the force at the propeller will be greater than the force at the wheels. And since the propeller is pushing air back, the air applies an equal and opposite force forward on the prop. This is the thrust force, which will be greater than the backwards force on the wheels. Okay. So, this car works like a lever or a pulley. By applying a small force to the wheels over a larger distance, the propeller can apply a larger force over a smaller distance. This is just like when you're riding a bike going uphill. You move the pedals fast, but with smaller force, to make the wheels move slower over the ground, but with a bigger force. But now we've run into the divide by zero problem that Professor Kosenko warned us about. When the speed of the car is exactly equal to the speed of the wind, it seems like the propeller can provide infinite force. That can't be right, can it? I mean, is our analysis flawed? And the answer is no, for two reasons. First of all, this is exactly what you'd expect, theoretically, with any lever or pulley. If one arm of the lever is zero, then you can lift an infinite weight with any amount of force on the other side. The catch is, its displacement will be zero. Second of all, in practice, there is a propeller efficiency term that is ill-defined when the propeller is not moving through the air. There's a better formula for the prop efficiency, which is well-defined in the zero speed limit. It, it, it makes an algebraic mess, but it's perfectly well-defined. And then the divide by zero problem is eliminated. But that equation makes the problem look more complicated than it actually is. You don't actually need aerodynamics. Here I have a little cart with a big wheel that rolls on two smaller spools. And what I'm going to show is that when you have two media moving relative to one another, well then if this car is in contact with both media, it can actually move faster than their relative velocity. So as I push the board to the right, you can see that the car goes down the board faster than the board is moving. If you look carefully, you'll see that the big wheel isn't turning the way that the board is pushing it. It's actually rotating in the opposite direction. That's just like the propeller on Blackbird, which pushes back against the air, and that's how it's able to go faster than the wind downwind. Now, you can build one of these cars for yourself at home, or you can build a model downwind cart. I told you Zyla was determined. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make the claim on camera. I, like, I think it's going to work this time. We're changing the propeller. It has to work before we get kicked out of the tunnel store. <laughs> of the cart works spectacularly, and it was designed to be replicated by anyone using just a 3D printer and a simple list of materials. She explains how to build it with more details on the engineering process on a video over on her channel, so go check it out. Now, Professor Kosenko has now conceded the bet, and he transferred $10,000 to me. So I want to thank him for being a man of honor and changing his mind in light of the evidence I presented, which is really not easy to do, especially in a public debate like this one. Now, I do not want to keep the money. I want to invest it in science communication. So I'm holding a one-minute video competition. I'll be awarding cash prizes 
to the top three videos that explain a counterintuitive STEM concept. I'll put some details down in the description. What I love about science is that disagreements are not problems. They are opportunities for everyone to learn something. I learned a lot more about Blackbird aerodynamics and gear ratios than I knew before. I also learned that I should go into more depth in my videos. I should make the evidence overwhelmingly convincing and put in some equations toward the end for those who want that level of detail. I want to thank everyone involved in making this video, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, Sean Carroll, Mark Drella, Professor Kosenko, and Xyla Foxlin, but especially Rick Cavallaro, the inventor and creator of Blackbird. He was a fountain of information, a constant source of support, and the man leading the charge to help people understand this area of physics for the past 15 years. Let's hope this video puts the issue to rest once and for all. The Blackbird craft all started with a brain teaser, and this video sponsor, Brilliant, offers you a daily problem to solve every day, like this one about gear ratios. If the first gear spins 10 times per second, at what rate does the final gear spin? Now, I did this problem the hard way, but my wife figured out how to do it the easy way. And that's what brain teasers are great for. They get you thinking about the world, and they give you insights into problems you might think you already understand. Just think about how much more you would understand in a year if you got into the habit of solving one novel, unexpected problem per day. And while you're at it, why not take one of Brilliant's courses, like on computer science, neural networks, or classical physics? Even physics professors can benefit from some lessons on frames of reference. Somehow, I managed to go my whole degree without learning Lagrangian mechanics, so that's a course I'm working through at the moment. It's a really elegant way of solving physics problems, and I wish I had learned about it sooner. For viewers of this channel, Brilliant are offering 20% off an annual subscription to the first 200 people to sign up. Just go to brilliant.org slash Veritasium. I will put that link down in the description. So, I want to thank Brilliant for supporting Veritasium, and I want to thank you for watching.
Alexander.
Вот это есть на самом деле. to today's talk. It's Wednesday the 17th of November and as you'll see it's a fairly grey day outside here in the north of England. And I'm going to be giving evidence from a paper today and the authors of this paper are suggesting that to get the optimum amount of vitamin D in the blood, to get the best amount of vitamin D in the blood, at this time of year adults need to be taking four to ten thousand units of vitamin D extra per day. That's 100 to 250 micrograms extra vitamin D per day. And they're also suggesting that with this we take 200 micrograms of vitamin K2 to make sure that the calcium that's released by the vitamin D goes into the bones and not into the tissues. So I'm going to do this video in two parts because it's quite involved. So I'm just going to give a short video now where we get the main points of this across if you've only got five or ten minutes. So uh, COVID-19 mortality, which correlates inversely with vitamin D3 status, is what this paper is about. In other words, you're more likely to die if your vitamin D is low. And they're saying that death rate could theoretically be brought down to close to zero. Now, of course, they're not saying that death rate ever would be zero, because there's always other factors involved. But this is a theoretical consideration, but it shows the power, potentially, the beneficial power of increasing our levels of vitamin D in the blood. And it's a systematic review and meta-analysis. Now this is the paper here, and of course I always put the links to it. Uh, Heidelberg and Tubingen in Germany. Um, it's a very impressive paper actually. You can get the download the PDF, you can get, the, I think this is the full text version of on here. So yeah, it's all there. And and th this paper actually is, is very, very 
well um, written. It's properly translated, and it's quite intelligible. If you read this, you will you will understand it. It's not it's not in scientific gobbledygook at all. Let's get straight down to it. Uh, blood uh, calcific diol, that's the active form of vitamin D in the blood, correlates strongly with SARS coronavirus 2 infection severity and in death. So no one really disagrees with this. The question is that some people are saying, well, it's actually the fact that you get sick that lowers your vitamin D levels. Well, I think it's people with low vitamin D levels that are likely to get sick in the first place. And that's what this paper is about. And that's what this paper argues for strongly, in my view, convincingly. And the fact that authorities haven't taken this on by now really is, uh, well, it's, it's just inexplicable why they haven't taken it on by, by now. This really needs to get its way into public health, government ordained advice, and it's simply not getting there. So is it cause or effect? So we believe it's cause, and that's what this paper is arguing for. Now the strength of our immune system more or less neglected by the responsible authorities. And I think you have to say this is right. You know, the authorities are focused on social restrictions, um, lockdown measures, vaccination measures, some might say expensive pharmaceuticals. Whereas we're not saying that those things are wrong, but we're saying we need to get the immune system optimized first. And it just doesn't seem to have been addressed very much, which is a bit surprising. So nutrition, physical fitness, recreation, sleep, all of these things are very important. Vitamin D deficiency is widespread in Europe and the United States, Canada, we, we know that. And the interesting thing, the data for this study was collected in March 2021, and it was collected on people that were unvaccinated. So this is not data which has been uh, affected by uh, vaccination, it's showing an independent uh, beneficial effect from optimising vitamin D levels in the blood. So it's a systematic literature review, retrospective cohort study. There was one good European-wide study on that, so there was one of those. And there were seven clinical studies, and they came to pretty well the same conclusion. Now this is good because one is a population study on basically healthy people who became ill. And the, the, other, the other is clinical studies on people who were ill. So two different ways of collecting data that came to essentially the same conclusions and we'll, we'll see that they are very, very closely related. Another reason I think these results are correct. Reported vitamin D levels pre-infection or on the day of hospital admission. So the big thing about this was they, knew, they took people into the study who they knew what the vitamin D levels were before or they took it on the first day of hospitalisation. And the key thing here is this is before the illness would have had a chance to lower their vitamin D levels. So it's not after the illness has lowered their vitamin D levels, it's what their vitamin D levels were to begin with. And of course, people with lower vitamin D levels did worse. People with higher vitamin D levels did better. Of course, they corrected the results for mortality rates for, um, for age, sex, um, diabetes, all the things you would expect. It, it was well, it's a well-controlled study. Now the results, they, they, what they found was that a negative Pearson correlation uh, between uh, D, D, D3 levels and mortality risk. Now this Pearson correlation is just um, a statistical tool and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative correlation. In other words, as vitamin D levels go up, illness goes down. Or as vitamin D levels go down, illness goes up. So just, just to just clarify that, because I know that can be a bit confusing. So if we look at smoking and uh, lung cancer, we could look at towns or countries where, where, where there's, so people that smoke more get more lung cancer. So we kind of get an upward trend like that. That would be a positive correlation like that. More smoking uh, causes more lung cancer. Well, it was correlation. That, that's how the cause of lung cancer was first identified. But you know, we can also have negative correlations as well. So a negative correlation, like if you look at the amount of exercise and the amount of obesity, that will go the other way around. It will be, the line will be in, a, in that direction. It will be the opposite effect. So um, whereas that one's a positive effect, this one will be an inverse or, or a, negative, a, a negative effect between exercise and, and obesity, for example. So, so that's what these things are. That they are these, these are correlations. And uh, these two, two, two different ways of collecting the data, as we said, one, one was negative 0.4 and one was negative 0.4 and a bit. 
So um, both negative. Now, if, if the correlation is a negative one, then that's a perfect negative correlation. If it's zero, there's no correlation at all. And if it's plus one, that's a perfect positive correlation. So we can see it's quite a convincing correlation here. I'm going to show you the lines in a minute. Now, the combined data set, uh, they found that the, uh, the median levels of vitamin D were 23.2 nanograms per mil. But as we'll look at, they want it to be higher than that. So anyway, when they looked at the combined data, now the more astute of you will have realized that the studies on their own, that p-value there is not actually significant. And that p-value is not actually significant. We need 0 0.05 or less. So really, that's non-significant data. But when they combined the data sets, they did get very significant data, which is good. So here we have that here. Um, the overall negative correlation was 3.9. And, and that does give a very, uh, very uh, significant result. And uh, the regression suggested a theoretical point of zero mortality at 50 nanograms per mil of vitamin D. Now, they're not saying this would happen. Of course not. They're not stupid. Uh, but it's a theoretical pointer. And here are the negative correlations here. So they are pretty uh, pretty convincing. Now the green one is the combined data, the red one is the population study, and the black one is the hospital data. But we can see for this, this uh, way of measuring death here, so that's increasing deaths up there. So as the vitamin D levels increased to increasing levels 10, 20, 30, so that's increasing vitamin D levels up there. We see that the death rate went down, and the green line we said there is the combined data, and the green line crosses the bottom line there at zero deaths at about just over 50, as we've said. So it's a theoretical consideration, but that's, that, that would be 50 nanograms per mil of vitamin D. But th there's very, very clear trends there that the, uh, the higher the levels of vitamin D, the lower the levels of death. It's very, very clear from that. High levels of vitamin D, lower levels of death. That, that will increase up there. So as the vitamin D levels increased to increasing levels, 10, 20, 30, so that's increasing vitamin D levels up there, we see that the death rate went down. And the green line we said there is the combined data. And the green line crosses the bottom line there at zero deaths at about just over 50, as we've said. So it's a theoretical consideration, but that's, that, that would be 50 nanograms per mil of vitamin D. But th there's very, very clear trends there. That the, uh, the higher the levels of vitamin D, the lower the levels of death. It's very, very clear from that. High levels of vitamin D, lower levels of death. And we believe that, as we've said, we believe that this is not an effect. We believe it's a cause because the vitamin D levels were known before the people were ill. So it's pretty convincing. Now, a lot more scientific data on the second video, but let's just give some brief conclusions now from this. Uh, the authors say, direct quote, the data set provides strong evidence that low D3 is a predictor rather than just a side effect of a severe infection. Despite ongoing vaccinations, we recommend raising serum 25 vitamin D levels to above 50 nanograms per mil. So that is what they recommend. And to do that, they have found that to do that consistently, you need these kind of levels. Um, 4,000 to 10,000 international units of vitamin D uh, per day. That's 100 micrograms to 250 micrograms per day for adults when the weather's cold like this, as, as in overcast. And they also recommend, as we'll see later, taking 200 micrograms of vitamin K2 with it. The fact that governments are not acting on this now, that there's so much evidence, and I'll be giving stacks of evidence in the next video, it really is, it's, it's hard to understand why governments are not taking mm -hmm. action on this now. So keep that short and sweet at the moment, and we'll look at more data in the next video. Thanks for watching this short one.
Вы получили 26, 26 миллионов денег. 26 миллионов. Ёбать, с этого я сейчас могу нанять вам кучу героев. 222к повреждения герой. Охренеть. Слушай, здесь монстры какие-то по, 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 по 7 миллионов.